Hello and welcome to Dr. Manoj's quick revision of important points for environmental science and engineering course EVS. This video is about the environment, ecosystem and biodiversity that forms the first unit. Watch and carefully listen to grasp the major concepts and key points. However, you must refer to one of the recommended textbooks for a more complete study. So, let's begin. This is what is listed in your syllabus for the unit on Environment, Ecosystem and Biodiversity. Basically, this unit is like a foundation course on environmental studies where you learn about the environment and its components both living and non-living. Then, you learn how these components interact with each other. We then see the difference between the variety of life that we see all around us as biodiversity and we learn its importance. In this lecture, you will very quickly learn the essence of the unit. So, stay with me and let us begin. The environment is defined as the sum total of biotic, which is living, and abiotic, which is non-living, components that surround any given organism. The biotic components can mainly be divided into producers, which are those organisms that are capable of directly obtaining energy from the sun and convert and store it as chemical energy in their bodies. These are plants. Then you have your consumers, which are organisms that are capable of obtaining energy by consuming the producers. And finally, you have the decomposers, which are organisms that are capable of consuming dead and decomposing producers and consumers. The systematic interaction between the biotic and abiotic components of the environment is termed as ecosystem. Ecosystem can be understood in terms of both structure and function. The primary function of the ecosystem is to circulate energy between the various components. This is done either by a simple unilinear transfer of energy from one component to the other known as food chain or through a complicated network of several food chains termed as food web. Now, here you can see a pictorial representations of both the food chain and the food web. Have a look at how transfer of energy through food travels. In a food web, you can see how each component could be consumed not just by one member but by a variety of members. For example, you can see how the mouse is a food source for the snake or the hawk. Here, the hawk can be considered as the apex predator since it can consume almost all of the consumers depicted in this food web. Now, we shall briefly have an overview of the different ecosystems, namely land and aquatic ecosystems. Okay? Land ecosystems are further divided into forest, grassland and desert ecosystem. These land ecosystems can be broadly again divided into two types. They are tropical which means those regions which are closer to the equator and consist of a hotter climate with ample to moderate rainfall and temperate regions which are further away from the equator where these have changing seasonal fluctuations or climates and generally have lower temperatures. Aquatic ecosystems can be broadly divided into flowing lotic and stagnant lentic ecosystems. Examples of lotic ecosystems are streams, rivers and oceans. Lentic ecosystems include ponds and reservoirs, both natural or artificial. The major factors influencing the nature of aquatic ecosystems include light, temperature and nutrients. The division of the aquatic ecosystem along these parameters is known as stratification. This photo shows the way in which the aquatic body is divided into different layers or strata. The process is called zonation or stratification. On the left, you can see the zonation in terms of the depth to which the light penetrates. By light, I mean sunlight, which is known as photic or a photic zone depending on whether sunlight reaches or does not reach. In the right side, you can see the stratification in terms of temperature. The deeper we go, 
the lower the sunlight penetration and the colder becomes the water. So, the three layers herein are epiliminion, metaliminion and hypoliminion. Between these is another layer not shown in the diagram which is called as thermocline. This is referred to an area where the temperature drastically declines. Okay. The right royal reason for any ecosystem to function is to cycle nutrients for energy through the various components both living and non-living. Every ecosystem becomes established through a process called ecological succession wherein a series of five steps namely nudation, initiation, reaction, competition and finally establishment enable the entry and establishment of species into an ecosystem. It's a very slow process and that's one of the reasons why ecosystems are so sensitive. Nobody is going to bring truckloads of nutrients every day to our planet from outer space. So mother nature needs to cycle the nutrients in a balanced manner and share it with everybody here. These cycles are what is known as biogeochemical cycles or nutrient cycles and you need to learn two of them namely oxygen cycle and nitrogen cycle. Here you can see a pictorial representation of the oxygen cycle which is the simplest to understand. Oxygen in the atmosphere is assimilated by animals through respiration and given back by plants during their respiration or process of photosynthesis. Have you understood this? Animals take up the oxygen from the atmosphere, they breathe it in and they give out carbon dioxide. The plants in turn breathe in the carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen thus returning it back into the atmosphere. Oxygen is also accumulated by weathering and oxidation processes happening in nature. The most next important cycle is nitrogen cycle which is almost impossible without the role of microorganisms. Nitrogen present in the atmosphere in its elemental gaseous form is brought and fixed into the soil by nitrogen fixing bacteria through their metabolic process. This converts the nitrogen into nitrates which are taken up by plants. Now nitrogen has entered the plant and on consumption nitrogen is transferred to the animals. On death and decomposition of these plants and animals nitrogen is released as ammonium which is again converted to nitrite by a process called nitrification. These things are done by microorganisms which are present inside the soil such as nitrosomonas, nitrobacter etc. Nitrates which comes from nitrites is converted and finally converted to elemental nitrogen by a process called denitrification which happens with the help of specific microorganisms called denitrifying bacteria. That's the nitrogen cycle. Familiarize yourself with a diagram or a flow chart that helps you illustrate this cycle. Okay. This concludes most of what sums up the portion on environment and ecosystem. What remains is biodiversity. Let's see what it is. Biodiversity is defined as the variety and variability among different living components in any ecosystem or the environment. Biodiversity can be studied under three types namely genetic diversity, species diversity and ecosystem diversity. Depending on the use, application, rarity and other characteristics, each living organism which makes part of the biodiversity is assigned a value called values of biodiversity. The major values of biodiversity are consumptive values, productive values, medicinal values, aesthetic values, ethical values, spiritual values and so on. Threats to biodiversity mainly include loss of habitat, poaching which involves the illegal hunting or sale of wildlife or wildlife related products and man wildlife conflict which results when animals or humans forcibly enter into each other's habitat. Okay. The components of biodiversity are graded on their importance in conservation by classifying them as endangered, threatened or rare. These are then catalogued in a red data book of the International Union for the Conservation of Natural Resources or IUCN. Now, there are regions in the planet with a heavy concentration of endemic species. Endemic species are those species 
which can only be found in that specific area or habitat. Such regions with a heavy concentration of endemic species are known as hotspots. There are about 28 hotspots identified worldwide that include places such as the Amazon forest. In India, there are two hotspots namely Western Ghats and Eastern Himalayas. Okay. So far, we have seen definition, types, values and threats to biodiversity. Now, we can understand that biodiversity needs to be conserved and that brings us to the conservation of biodiversity. Conservation of biodiversity is again into two types. They are in situ conservation of biodiversity and ex situ conservation of biodiversity. In in situ conservation, the plants and animals are conserved within their own habitat. Examples will include wildlife sanctuaries, national parks and reserve forests. In ex situ conservation, samples in the form of DNA or germplasm is taken from the plants and animals that require to be conserved and stored in repositories such as tissue culture banks or gene banks. Cryofreezing is one such technique used here where these Live specimens or biological specimens are stored in liquid nitrogen. There is one other aspect to this unit and that includes the biogeographical classification of India. Geographical regions of India are each unique in their composition with respect to biodiversity. They include regions such as the Trans Himalayan region, the Western Ghats, Deccan Peninsula, Gangetic Plains and the islands such as Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Good. That sums up the lecture on your first unit, which is Environment, Ecosystem and Biodiversity. See you again soon. Bye-bye.